Right, as you've returned from lunch on time, we're going to start on time, even if there are laggards who are sitting out there enjoying the sun. Um, so thank you very much indeed. We've got an hour. My name is Nick Gowing, and what I want to do, and I'm standing up here because I want to engage you right from the get-go, and I want to give you 60 seconds warning that I'd be delighted to hear from you because there's a danger in these kind of sessions that we all tell you what you should be thinking. I think the mood is changing, and that's why I've been asked to be here, to try and bring all of you in as well. You've heard from Mohammed al Baradei particularly, and also the mayor this morning, about how difficult things are becoming. I haven't been here for the whole of the conference so far. But my, my encouragement to you is we've got to rattle the cage. This is inspiring our future. And as the mood was this morning, it was one of what was, I think, summarized as pessimism. I'd like to say that I think there are ways of thriving on change here. Change which is being created by disruption at the moment, and disruption which is out of everyone's hands in so many ways, whether it be AI algorithms, Russia, so many things being pushed back by the public, uh, whether we call it populism, nationalism, or whatever, with the real danger of society being hollowed out because the nature of value and of wealth is changing. And I'm going to put ideas directly to you now about purpose, about values, about the expectations of government, about the expectations of corporates as well. These are all on the agenda. It's tempting to say, well, we'll have a plan for 2030. I've got news for you, 2030 is in six hours' time. And that's the speed at which things are happening. So I've given you 60 seconds warning. Uh, and I will introduce uh, the, the speakers as well. But please come in and be rattle the cage so I don't have to do it all um, in terms of what we should be thinking, particularly if you're from the next generation. Because we, as we heard from Mohammed El Baradei, reflecting a very significant view out there, which is the next generation is frustrated, anxious, and getting angry, um, both about the way corporates are behaving, the way governments are behaving as well. It's about the, the way in which those who are being governed, those who are being sold to by the corporate sector are losing um, affection or respect for those who are, who are running companies uh, and also governments as well. So we can try to do this in a kind of existing framing, or we can be far more radical to set the tone for harassis over the coming months in the next summits as well and what happens in the next 48 hours here. So please see the next 55 minutes in, the, in those terms. Who would like the microphone? I've got two microphones, please. I can't have you all sitting on your hands for the next. Please, a microphone here. Anyone else, quickly. And get the microphone there. So we have Jose Manuel Barroso, who obviously well known here, uh, former prime minister here, and also uh, president of the European Commission, now working uh, not in Lisbon, but for Goldman Sachs uh, in London. We also have uh, Vijay Esoran, who's chairman of uh, QI Limited, uh, and that's important because he is based in Hong Kong and Malaysia, but running a massive global corporate enterprise. And John Negroponte, vice chairman of McClarty Associates, with a long background in the US government, particularly as ambassador and also in the intelligence community as well. So I can see hands going up. Where are you, please? Second microphone, who else has got a hand up? Please, you've got a microphone, go. go. Hello, thank you so much. Wendy Dent, Guardian US. You said to rattle the cage. So we have you know, a panel of three men and a moderator. How are you inspiring women to be involved? I told you we would go for the jugular right from the get-go. Please. Please, you've got the microphone. Who else wants a microphone? Well, please, at the back. Go ahead. We want me to start with a question. Well, I'm really wondering what's your take on Brexit, if it's going to bring more prosperity uh, to whole Europe or not. Okay, we'll stack that up. There was a lunch about that, please. Who else wants the microphone? I, I would like to ask a question. Um, I'd like the discussants to address the following question. If you had to be in charge of a global push to wage peace effectively in a war plagued by war or preparations for war, what would you do? What organizational framework for waging peace do we need now that we don't have, particularly in light of what's going on in the Middle East? Wage peace effectively. Who else? Please, a lady there. And please, the next generation too. You don't have to admit to being a millennial. Yes. Uh, Christine Alfonso Erzan from uh, New York. Uh, my question is about entitlements and national debt. Obviously, it's an issue in the United States, but I think that it's an issue across most of the 
uh, developed world, so I'd like to know what suggestions you have on, on the subjects. What is your fear there? What is your fear on entitlement and national debt? Well, certainly in the U.S., as part of a younger generation, the entitlements, um, there's really not a plan for how best to deal with them, and our national debt has just gone through the roof. And you're concerned about that? Certainly. I okay. think everyone should be. These are the concerns which I really wanted smoked out. Who else has got the microphone? Please. Anyone else got the mi hand up? Please. Lady here. Could we move the microphone here? Who else has got the mic? Here, please. Yes, my question is about immigration, and is in particular uh, the wave of illegal immigration. What is your take on that? And Could you just repeat if it's that? going to be solved. Immigration, immigration, and in particular, illegal immigration. And what is your take on that? Be a bit more specific. What do you mean, take on immigration? <coughs> well, the take is that illegal immigration, yes, and the waves that are coming everywhere, from everywhere. What would be your position to that? Okay, mobility. Anyone else, please? Uh, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Sakyan, right here, to the right. Yeah, uh, my name is Sakyan. I'm from Kazakhstan. And my question is, uh, in a world that seems to be polarizing in, you know, three big, big centers or two big centers, how do the smaller and medium countries navigate this changing and more risky field? Okay, please. Yes, gentlemen here. Move uh, the microphone around. Alain Martin, my question is, what we are witnessing in Hungary and in Poland is just a parenthesis or nor going to be a normalization of deviance with respect to the EU? Ho Hungary and Poland, just parenthesis or much more. Who else has got the microphone, please? Can Down I... here, Patrick. Over here? Yep, here, yep. please. Have you got the mic? Okay, please. Laura Koch, <laughs> I just want to put a little bit of uh, positivism to all this, optimism. And do you think that there is a movement in the world where companies will be balancing in a very a, a good way, positive way, purpose and profits? And values? And yeah, purpose will be values and, and things that matter. And it's, this question is because after uh, BlackRock and Vanguard in January came with the announcement that they only want to invest in companies that are uh, creating some social good. Do you and think that's moving in a certain direction at the moment or not? Well, I think that uh, the fact that only a month ago uh, Danone, uh, one of the biggest companies in food, has just been B certified and has a benefit corporation, that's a good movement. But uh, those, the same thing, uh, Unilever started six years ago reporting every six months and nobody followed. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay. and, uh, that was a great idea, but nobody followed. Thank you. Shift the microphone back, please. Who else? I'm going to take three more for the moment, please. Should the world leadership have a contingency plan in terms of exo diplomacy? In terms of exo diplomacy. Okay. One more, please, Pachi. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Arke Pachari. Um, I wanted to ask how do we rescue democracy and uh, the exercise of democratic principles and values? from the power of lobbies and vested interests. We have a session tomorrow on climate change, but that's an area where clearly the lobbies are extremely powerful in blocking action. That's true of gun control and so many other areas where there's clearly been a shift over time. How do we res rescue democracy from the power of the lobbies? All right. Guy Girazan, uh, Public Foundation. Uh, we all are very con conscious about central banks putting limitations on economy and every percent is like a big battle for any country and globally. But now we have created as free economies uh, several mega monopolies that without any control impose a severe limitation on economic activity in the world like Facebook, Google and you know others. Uh, what is your view on, on this right. battle? I'm being pushed hard. Two more please and then Hara. back. Harold Anspan, Parker and Gamble. Uh, my question is, what is the best single argument to talk Mr. Trump out of starting all these trade wars, and who should be delivering that message? I was hoping that name wouldn't come up. Uh, could you just move back? Sorry. We'll get, take these two ladies, please. She's gone. OK, please. Hi there, uh, Salman Ravala from uh, New York, United States. 
My question is regarding education. We're looking at the SDG panel from yesterday and talking about some sort of universal education platform which allows people across the world, including young people, to be inspired and have a level playing field when it comes to the education field. I'd Are you like talking about skills as well? That's right. Okay, thank you. One more, and then that'll be it for the moment, please. <laughs> okay. Hi, Thomas Pacquia from New York. In honor of Goldman Sachs firing up a cryptocurrency trading desk, what role does Bitcoin have going forward <laughs> in economies where central banker policies are either failed or okay. failing? Thank you. Now look, the reason for this is because those on the, on the platform can now work out what's on your mind. And I'd like you, uh, in the uh, remarks that you've partly prepared, to think about some of these things, because these are right at the cutting edge of what you are all concerned about. But let me, Vijay, first of all, go to you, because you've made something very, you made a very important point in your press conference earlier about ethical leadership. And you run a, a massive company now, and I <coughs> last saw you three weeks ago in London, where you reminded me that when you were doing your university degree, uh, you were actually driving a taxi to make ends meet, so you've done pretty well. Ethical values, picking up from that view down there about ethics, values, profit, and purpose. Give us your view, please, in four minutes. I believe that um, a company that is not purpose-driven, as you use the word purpose, I think it's a good one, a, co a company that's not purpose-driven is essentially one that is lost or is going to be losing its way. We are 20 years old right now as a company, and uh, it is our purpose, I think, that has kept us together. The fact of the matter is we are, we are in a sense, we are an e-commerce company. We are scattered over 100 countries across the world. We have 20 million people in our database that we work with and sell to, and essentially, the thing that holds us together is the concept. We actually began by identifying uh, with an iconic leader, which was to us Mahatma Gandhi. It was logical for us to relate to him because he was a man who belonged to the world. He was one who was able to move the world without having a title, a position, any kind of power per se, uh, neither president of a country nor affiliated to any political party. And yet, he, his voice was held and and delivered across so many nations for such a length of time. To us, that resonated. Because right now, the current uh, generation, the millennials who are coming into being, they are a different breed of people altogether. They do not recognize the same things by which we have been, to a great extent, brainwashed, if you like. You see, they are a product of a very unique uh, generation. They have access to more information than we ever had thought possible and they have it at the touch of a button. So it's in, in, incredible, uh, the kind of information, and yet also false information that's out there that they have to discern and find their ways uh, out of. They are also product of university and education systems that are essentially you know, created way back in the 19th century, trained by teachers from the 20th century to prepare them for the 21st. There's a major disconnect. So this is one of the issues that we find dealing with and going across all of these borders. My answer to this is very simple. If a company is going to exist within the concept of a global village, it has to go beyond profit. There is simply no other way. It has to be purpose-driven. And to add on to it, uh, <coughs> there was a lady who brought an issue of uh, there are three men here. And uh, gender parity is something that's very important to us. I would say there's no man who's sitting here in this audience anywhere who's not here because of some woman who has driven him to this point in his life. Be it his mother, his sister, you know. It's women who brought me to, my, to where I am right now. I had very strong, very independent, very powerful women who influenced me and brought this in me. So if I'm here sitting down here today, it's because of so many women in my life. Thank you, but that particular point about Lice, uh, which can be broadly summarized, is, is capitalism facing a, a really serious challenge of its license to operate because of the pushback from particularly the next generation, yes or no? Yes. I would say, uh, yes, it is facing a challenge, but one it can overcome and needs to overcome. And I think it is already happening organically. Because, you see, in essence, we in the corporate sector have to react to the customer database, to, to the customers. And the customers' requirements and wants today are so much more different than they were you know, a decade or two decades ago. <coughs> so we have to respond to that far faster than most governments need to. 
We need to respond to them across global lines, as it were. So, yes, I think that the, the organic change is happening as we speak. Right, we've got two other panelists who bestride the role between politics, uh, government, and now in the private sector. Uh, John Negroponte, and I'm gonna ask you both about democracy, but a number of questions there about leadership, about rescuing democracy, um, about movements, ab about worried about the relationship between those in power and those that are being governed or served. How are you seeing it now in a, in, in a large partnership in Washington, D.C.? Democracy having to be rescued. And I'll come on to particularly Hungary and Poland. Are they just in parentheses, or is there something much bigger happening there, which really is going to be profound for our future? Thanks, Dick. <laughs> if I could just on one point about the, the pre previous question that VJ talked about, about involving women more. I think uh, one way I see it happening, I've been teaching for nine years since I retired from government, is uh, through the education system you just see a, 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 an incredible burgeoning of the role uh, of women, uh, often more than 50 percent of the uh, enrollment of uh, universities. I, I can tell you from my personal experience that uh, women tend to, as a general rule, do better academically in terms of their performance. And so I think you're going to see uh, just a natural evolution towards a much stronger role by women in all facets uh, of our life. Uh, democracy. Uh, I guess you could argue that democracy in some respects is alive and well in the United States, although it's not the part of democracy that uh, uh, we normally uh, think about, and that's the system of checks and balances that we have. When Mr. Trump tried to uh, promulgate some rules that would uh, arbitrarily uh, prevent uh, the migration of certain people into the United States, he was stopped uh, by the courts. Uh, I think that uh, depending on how uh, the uh, investigation by Mr. Mueller and others uh, evolves, uh, he could also uh, face uh, some difficulties uh, with the Congress, especially if the majority of the House of Representatives <coughs> changes uh, in the elections that are coming up in this, uh, this coming uh, November, and there's a Democratic majority. So uh, there's that aspect. But I, I would say, more broadly speaking, uh, that really uh, we've got this question of uh, there is no substitute yet. No one's invented it, although we, we hear some uh, suggestions of having a, a, some sort of idealized global system. I, I detected a touch of that in some of the remarks by Mr. Albaradai this morning. But uh, I, we haven't really have invented a good substitute for the nation state and the Westphalian system. And I think that uh, one of the issues that's going to affect and be very important to us going forward is how to protect the institutions of nation states and make sure that they remain strong and stable and the the do you think they're at risk at the moment they're what are they at risk at the moment well i think yes where you have uh, state failure in a number of cases maybe a, a good extreme example w at the moment would be the country of venezuela where it, which is in a complete state of collapse uh, the country with the largest uh, oil reserves in the world has managed to um, evolve into such a uh, disastrous uh, situation. There are problems of, uh, of uh, state failure in different uh, continents and different parts of the world. And I think they're under some, I wouldn't say threat, because I don't see the American system. I think that whatever is happening now will, will pass. Uh, I thought uh, President Sampaio's remark yesterday when, uh, when he posed the question, what is permanent and what is accidental? I think uh, a certain amount of what's happening in our country, at least at the moment, is accidental, and I think democracy will, over time, prosper. But uh, uh, we've got to think hard about how to maintain world order in the face of some of these states uh, collapsing. And uh, we've, nation building has uh, uh, become a sort of a dirty word. Regime change is obviously not the answer for a lot of these problems. So we've got to think long and hard about how in the future are we going to rise up to the challenge, we as the international community, to improving 
uh, governance around the world? Not, not an easy question, and I don't think we can argue that we've been especially successful in the past uh, several decades. Just to pick up again on what uh, Vijay was saying, and it'll come to you, Jose Manuel, in a moment, but this issue of purpose and values. You're, you're bridging now into the commercial sector. Do you see a change? Yeah. Do, do you, uh, let me just check with John, if I may, Jose Manuel. Uh, do you see a change among your clients of understanding the relationship with customers, clients, and the public? John, can I just check with John? No. Uh, yes, I, I think the short answer is yes, although I think in the United States we've got a long ways to go, uh, particularly, and I think this goes a little bit to VJ's point, uh, when you're, you're governing, I think you use the phrase uh, that you can't, you can't do it just for profit. You can't, uh, you've, got to, you've got to think about these other questions. But I think the quarterly uh, earnings system is a, an impediment in, the, in that regard because there are so many people in our business community who are expert in how to squeeze out the last cent of profit from every dollar that is deployed. And we were talking about it yesterday in <coughs> one of the sessions. It manifests itself in our country but by what I think is a, a, a tremendous ethical gap, and that is the absence of universal health care, so that if people lose their job, very often they face uh, not having health care, uh, which is, uh, it, I think, unknown in the other OECD countries. It's a serious, in my view, ethical uh, problem because it affects how people decide what jobs to pursue, uh, and uh, and, and uh, when, they're, when they're out of work, very often they lose their health care. Joseph Manuel, thanks for your patience, but pick up on those points as your chairman of Goldman Sachs International. What are you seeing, even in your own company, um, both in Britain and elsewhere, about the change in attitude to value, to purpose, and so on? And we'll move on to democracy in a okay. moment. No, I think there is a world before and after the financial crisis. The last financial crisis, we are still feeling the ripple effects all over the world. And certainly in the financial sector, uh, it is a before and after. Also because of the move that happened afterwards, including, if I may say so, in Europe, in the European Commission. I was chairing the Commission when we launched more than 40 pieces of legislation to introduce new um, standards in terms of regulation, supervision. And I believe in the companies, since you mentioned Goldman Sachs, let me tell you, I'm a non-executive chairman of Goldman Sachs International. I would say that 80% of my time there is with compliance, with issues regarding transparency, integrity, ethics, the culture of the organization. It's amazing what's going on. And in the other, and now I'm in contact, of course, with the British regulators and the other international financial institutions based in London that still is, uh, I think, the financial capital of Europe. Uh, it's amazing what's going on in that matter. So, I really believe there is a change, though I cannot answer to you honestly if that is going to be a, a fundamental change, but I think we are in a new stage. Uh, and uh, regarding your general issue about capitalism, um, I think capitalism and democracy are more resilient than people usually admit. I think that uh, with all its imperfections, market economies are much more able to resist, to change, and to adapt to new circumstances than state interventionist uh, and democracy as well. Democracies are much more stable than dictatorships. Some, think, some people believe that dictatorships are more stable. That's an illusion. They can crumble like that. My country here, I remember, we were living 48 years of dictatorship. I was 18 years old. And from one night, it crumbled. And now we are a vibrant uh, democracy. And so today we have the illusion when we see some countries that are authoritarian, oh, they are the strong ones. False. It's an, an illusion. In fact, this can change very quickly. While democracies, they adapt, they are incremental, they are adaptive by nature. Sometimes it's frustrating what we are seeing. But the cap when the system becomes more, more uh, challenging outside, it's better to have a higher degree of diversity in our own systems to deal with it. And basically what happens, the issue about values, I think today we have, and you have mentioned that as well, we have probably too much information. I mean, I will not say too much because I like information. The, the great issue today is how to go from information to knowledge and from knowledge to wisdom. From information to knowledge, I had a professor in the United States once, he said to me, Knowledge is the process by which you eliminate useless information. 
Because we have too much information. We have to be able to, to do it. And that is criti critical. But knowledge, you know, it's not enough. Today we need a wisdom. And wisdom, from my point of view, is knowledge used with good judgment and in a firm set of values. Jose That's Manuel, why can values I, are can critically important for corporate <clears throat> or for um, uh, political or public uh, leadership. Let me just drill down, because there was that question about whether Poland and Hungary are just parentheses in de democracy. And John has made that point that in many ways democracy is flourishing now. Is what's happened in Germany, the AFD, what's happened in Hungary, what's happened in Poland, what's happened in Italy, what's happened with the U in the UK with the referendum, the public has spoken, even if many think or worry it's an undemocratic process. Is this the strength of democracy we, are, we have to live with now? We have to adapt. Uh, the public has spoken and we have to respect the majority. Of course, it's important that the majority respects always because the, the minorities as well. Because democracy is not just majority rule. Majority is, uh, democracy is majority rule and respect of minority. So in Britain, I, did not, I was not happy with the result, but we have to accept the result. We are de de democratic persons. So they, they decided to leave the European Union. They will leave. By the way, that shows that the European Union is a free association of free countries. No one is remaining, no European country is remaining European Union against its own will. It was not like that in former empires, or not to go far away, in the Soviet Union. In and that Soviet question Union. about so Hung that's Hungary good. and Poland. Hungary and Poland. Hungary and Poland. Now, there are concerns with the rule of law in some of these countries. And this, the European Union, by the way, is dealing with them. I also have these concerns. Having said that, I believe the societies in those countries and also the European environment are sufficiently strong to avoid those countries going uh, completely the wrong way for dictatorship. I believe we are going to, these countries are going to become um, pluralistic and, uh, let's say, respecting fully the, the rule of law. And I think it's important to have a, a, a strong, honest dialogue with them. Uh, but I think it's a mistake to put them in a corner because sometimes some criticisms made to those countries, if they are not intelligently made, they will only reinforce the nationalistic trends there. It's extremely difficult to have this kind. It started, in fact, when I was in the commission, I had to launch some infringement procedures against Hungary. At the end, they respected the rulings, uh, but it has to be done in an intelligent manner because these countries are countries that only very recently became democracies. They were under totalitarian communist systems, extremely hypocritical, and they are always fearing an outside power. So it's important that the European Union engages uh, interesting and uh, intelligent, wise dialogue with those countries. But for instance, the, the dynamism of the society in Poland, it's amazing. Poland is one of the fastest growing economies in, in Europe and with a very vibrant economic, uh, civil society. So I continue to keep my full faith in the capacity of those countries to develop a strong, stable, dynamic uh, democracy. PJ, quick comment. I think it is a learning curve. You must remember where Poland and Hungary are coming from. And for the longest time, from the other side of the Iron Curtain, so to speak, they've never really had to express nationalism. They're just getting their first shot at it. And I think, you know, it is, uh, it's a throwback, if you like, to feelings that they need to expunge themselves off. But whether the next generation of Polish and Hungarians who are now coming into being, whether they would actually subscribe to this is another matter altogether. Something they have to go through the process of learning. The same thing applies to companies. When we, when we talk in terms of companies and purpose-driven companies uh, per se, it needs to be also analyzed differently because there are companies that are 100 years old and the companies that are 50 years old and the companies that are well-established, so to speak, in certain certain practices and so on and so forth, they need to break free of that. And that's a process that, and I think the fundamental factor is fear. Whereas the startup companies, the new generation of companies, the companies that have begun in the last, say, two or three decades are essentially different in their thinking. They did begin with purpose as opposed to profit. And a lot of them actually that I'm aware of and that we are dealing with across the world have purpose. And, and for us, for example, we. Take us for an example. We began from day one with putting aside a certain aspect of our profits for giving back to the community, for doing things and running projects and hospitals and so on and so forth. And we are not alone in doing this. And that's essentially the problem. John, yeah, just one, one sentence on this Poland and 
and Hungary issue, which to my way of thinking is that it's better these events are happening with those two countries within the European exactly. Union exactly. than outside. I think it uh, makes an important <coughs> difference. And there is could, a point, if I may, because there was a question as well. This is linked also to the issue of illegal migration. Well, could I, yeah, could yeah. I pick up that point? Because and, I want to, I'm trying and, to pick up many of those and, points. Because you've and, got the paradox at the moment of immigration, migration being a kind of dirty word. But many economies need skills yeah. and labor. Yet politically, as we've seen in Germany, we're seeing in, in the United Kingdom, we've seen in Hungary, Migrants are seen as a dirty part of politics to be got rid of at a time when labor and skills are needed for economic development. How in the future is this paradox and contradiction going to be resolved? I, I, I was saying that precisely part of the developments that are taking place in Poland and in Hungary and in other Central Eastern European countries is related to the fact that they see the European Union imposing them the acceptance of refugees and illegal migrants. And so I think that matter was not very intelligently handled. Because those countries, in fact, differently from other countries like Portugal or Spain or France or the UK or, or, or former, uh, let's say, heads of colonies, they are not used to multicultural. So they have never seen Africans. They have never seen Muslim people. They have never seen different religions. And so we have, of course, to make this um, sharing of responsibility of uh, refugees but it has to be done in a, not by a decision taken in Brussels, but by some kind of consensual approach. Is that achievable, do you uh, think? I think it has to be, uh, by the way, because we as Europeans, we have more than capacity, financial and also dimension, to integrate the refugees. And that's, by the way, humanitarian uh, duty, not only by, from the European Union, from the United Nations there is. We are bound by the Convention on Refugees. So I think we have to be open and humanitarian. But regarding illegal migration, I think we have to be realistic. We cannot say that we can ac accept everybody that comes to our countries. If the Europeans want to keep freedom of movement inside, they have to be credible in terms of defending the external border of the European Union. And uh, one of the things that is now fueling nationalistic, sometimes xenophobic movements in Europe that are in fact putting a challenge to the mainstream parties, to the so-called establishment, is that movement. So I think we have to find a way of managed migration. As you said, Nick, you are completely right. In most of our societies in Europe, and I would say probably in the West, we need more migrants because also because of demographic cycles, so we need more. But our countries, our, a, small, a small city, in the central of Europe, they don't want to have from one day to another one receiving uh, uh, all uh, migrants that will change the culture of that country. It was not only Central Eastern European countries. In fact, that started with Switzerland. In Switzerland, we saw that. And Switzerland is certainly a very uh, active uh, democracy. So we have to show our people, yes, we are generous, accepting um, uh, refugees, but we have to show that we have realistic policies of migration. If not, we are going to have a backlash with nationalism, a protectionism, and even xenophobia. John and Negroponte, that's a challenge for us. the political cost on this issue. Well, <laughs> so uh, it's, this is a sort of a conflict between social considerations and uh, economic ones. I mean, the United States is a country built on immigration. And today, 14% of the United States population is foreign born, which is the highest level uh, that it has been since 1910. And in fact, after restrictive immigration practices were, uh, laws were passed in the 1920s, the foreign born population fell and continued to fall down through our depression during World War II until it once again began to, uh, to rise again. Uh, there's clearly an economic need uh, for migrants. We have a full employment uh, economy. There are a lot of sectors that are uh, 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 craving uh, to have uh, employees. But you mentioned the political part. Uh, this was, as talk about populism and President Trump and, uh, and others, this was a campaign issue. It might, I think migration was probably one of the single most, if not the single yeah, most the important Brexit. Uh, issue in these uh, elections which had populistic outcomes. I think over time these issues are going to work themselves out, but they're very messy uh, and in the short run I think even socially uh, unpleasant in terms of incidents, uh, 
ugly rhetoric. I mean, the reason I'm a Republican, the reason I opposed Mr. Trump and actually came out in support of Mrs. Clinton was because of the things he said about Hispanics. Quite honestly, it was that single. I have five adopted children from Honduras from the time that I served in Latin America, and I just could not face my family uh, and those young people uh, in light, uh, with, with what Mr. Trump had said. Do you think, uh, Vijay, do you want to come in here? Real quickly, I mean, the United States would not be where it is today if it wasn't for migration. <laughs> if one were to take a look at Silicon Valley per se, it's fueled, in essence, from migration from my corner of the world, from Asia, and has driven the European economy, I'm sorry, the American economy to this point in time. And uh, it is the European migration that fueled both the United States and Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and so many other countries. Yeah. And if one were to take a look at, say, Thailand as an example, or Costa Rica, it is Americans and Europeans <laughs> who are coming to retire over there. So, I mean, in essence, migration is a two-way street. You know, so I, I think that one should recognize the fact that in a free market there would be a certain amount of migration that is required and needs to fuel the economy. To be totally in fear of it is a challenge. Quickly, both of you, I mean, given the emotions attached to migration, particularly after 2015 in Europe and what we've seen elsewhere, can emotions eventually be eclipsed in the interests of economic necessity? Can that be part of a political process or not? I think the fact, precisely, that this resistance against migration came in the United States, as we all agree that it was impossible to have the great power, economic and not only, of the United States without migration. And in Britain, the issue of migrants was, I think, my opinion, was probably the most defining issue in the Brexit vote. And Britain is certainly one of the most open countries in the world. And we now have full employment. And we, we have, we're short of workers. No, I see. All, all over London, people are asking for more people to work. And so, but, but in fact, one of the most important arguments of the Brexit years was we don't want so many foreigners, or Europeans, but foreigners, that are now putting pressure on our uh, public services and social security and so on and so forth. So when we see some of those countries that are traditionally some of the more open in the world, uh, being, let's say, affected by this, I think we have to be realistic. I know uh, what I'm going to say, it's probably not politically correct, but we have to be realistic. And, do, and to be realistic, it means, yes, keep an open order, being open, but at the same time showing our population that we have, are able to control my legal flux. For instance, what's happening today we, in Italy and Greece, when have, I, I was in Lampedusa when I saw, saw those tragic events there, it's um, that resistance against the European Union and Italy today has also to do with the perception that Italians have that Europe has not done enough to help them protect their borders. So we have to find a way, and I think leadership here, I think, by the way, Angela Merkel, I think she was great. Many people accuse her, but I think we have to think counterfactually. When she said, refugees welcome, many people said, that was not the right thing to say, and that's now she's suffering the pools because of that. But let's think counterfactually. Would we like to see her, would we like to see Germany or Europe to say, refugees, no, well, not welcome? No. She took a position of principle, but now the Germans, in their typical organized way, they are trying to, to control the, 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 the flows. John, so quickly, on, on, the, on the kind of handbrake turn that might be needed politically to say, we're running out of skills, we're running out of labor in America. Right, well, it, it doesn't happen quite that way. What, it, it's kind of interesting. We still take one million migrants a year. I mean, uh, get legal immigration into the United States. And we still have a system of visas for temporary workers, and we're doing that. But where the emotional part arises, for example, and I think Mr. Trump used that in effect, uh, it came with refugees. And so what did we do? We cut in half the number of refugee admittances using uh, the situation in Syria and so forth as a, as a pretext for doing that. So I, I don't know whether how it's going to work uh, politically, but I think as a practical matter, uh, beneath the screen, I think, uh, you know, under, uh, below the radar screen, I think that the migration will continue. The long-term solution, well, if you look a little bit back at 1910, 1920, when America had a lot of the waves of migration coming from uh, Eastern and Southern Europe, is integration into our society, but it takes, it takes a generation or two 
Rob? Uh, All right, your questions are driving me on this one. Now, there was an important question towards the end about education and about skills. And you have a university, you've created a university, VJ, about this, 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 this issue here of the, the changing profile of what is needed, partly because of the demographics of the aging population, <coughs> but also the acute demand from AI and algorithms and the significant shift on data. What's your view here on that question from the audience about education, universal education and skills? Well, the first thing we need to do is change the programming for students. We, in, you know, unfortunately, uh, have had a tendency to create job seekers. And this is something the universities are programmed to do. They have, in essence, become you know, degree factories that have been sending out wave after wave of students who have been, you know, in essence, trained to look for jobs. And um, if you take a look at, in, in the Eastern way of looking at it, i.e. in China, in, in Shanghai, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, students who come out of these universities, and if you were to do a poll, in fact, a poll was done where, we, where the top 10 students from the, from the top 10 universities were asked what they would like to achieve in five years or 10. Whereas the students who are coming out of, say, the best universities from the systems here in, in the UK, uh, and the U.S. Were, talk, were looking to go out there and find the best jobs, lowest hanging fruit, as it were, to become CEO of this, that, and the other. The students from the East were looking towards creating jobs. They were looking towards going out there and saying, in five years, I want to have a company with 100 people under me. And that is a mentality that we need to start emerging again. Because it is trade that has driven you know, uh, growth all, you know, all over the world. Historically, you know, it is trade that brought Portugal to the Far East. And thereafter, Holland, and then Great Britain, Spain, to South America. It's trade that developed the glo global hegemonies that took place thereafter. And it is trade that President Xi Jinping of China is now driving with his, you know, Silk and Belt Road project. His entire, uh, uh, the concept, the billions that are being poured into developing that entire corridor going towards Europe, and even the sea maritime trade, is driven with the concept of driving trade. Trade develops economies, trade develops industries. And even when one were to take a look, are we preparing students for this? Are we preparing students for the new world order, so to speak, where trade has to be across borders as opposed to isolationism, which is what is unfortunately the name of the game right now. I mean, if one were to take a look at, say, Brexit, for example, or for that matter, you know, um, the American uh, current elections and, and mm. Hungary and Poland, are these really economic issues or are they political ones? Because that goes to the heart of the matter. Uh, very much identity issues. Exactly. Uh, uh, so I Skill, think that, skills in education, please. Yeah. Just Ident identity and also people who have been left behind by developments and where we've not maybe done as much as we could to help those people who have been affected by uh, recent economic developments, so, right? Exactly. I, I, I think politicians are going into the fray because they are aware of these perceptions, per se. But perceptions and reality are two different things on the ground. And in my opinion, economically speaking, it, it is essentially the free market that is driven trade. And China is actually making the full use of that, while the rest of the world is going into isolationism, with the exception of Macron and Trudeau, perhaps. But having said that, China is, is pouring billions into building economies on this path that they have begun. Jose Manuel, education and skills, that particular question. Look, I have been, uh, in fact, I, I'm very happy that you put me at the question because I'm now working with Gordon Brown. We have created a global commission for education. We present a report to the Secretary General. And now we are trying to, to build a facility raising billions, billions in terms of private public to fund education globally. Because, in fact, I found that one thing, I mean, we know one thing interesting, is that if you look at the development, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, if you look at the public financing for education, for development in developing uh, countries, in fact, it's, I would say, the, the poor area compared for with health. Why? Because uh, when you launch, for instance, you put some money to fight malaria or to fight AIDS, it was to a large extent successful, those facilities. Or, um, the Ebola, it was a great success of response to the Ebola. 
Because it's eventually. Such, uh, uh, yes. Eventually. Yes, but it took some time. But look, education now. Because if you if you fund education now, you see the results in 10, 20, 30 years. So that's why we need, I think, a more structured global response to support education globally, namely in the developing countries. That is the issue for, for Africa. We have not yet mentioned Africa during this panel. The Africa, I think, has a great future. I think the great reserve of growth in the world is going to come from Africa, because now the Asian economies are already reaching maturity. So Africa is the real reserve for global growth, let's say, uh, in the next decades. But for that, they need more in terms of education. So I think we have to do globally a better effort. At the same time, in the more developed economies, as you agreed, I mean, the way we, we, we um, target uh, uh, the goals of education in terms of the curricula, in terms of the training, has to be, of course, in some cases, radical, radically changed. Because uh, today we have a world that is moving at a, another pace. We cannot go with the traditional uh, methods of, of education. And I think a lot also is happening. In Europe, there is a silent revolution going on. I, I teach here at Lisbon University as well, as I teach in, in Geneva. I mean, you cannot hear. The language you listen to most in Catholic University in Lisbon is English. There are in many classes I have, I have many more people I have from Brazil, from the former Portuguese colonies, but from Germany, from uh, Russia, from China. There is the campus today changed completely. When I was a student at the university here, I had no one except, I mean, one or two from the former Portuguese colonies. Every, everybody was Portuguese. Today it changed completely. And the same applies, of course, to other parts of Europe. So there is a silent revolution going on, not only Erasmus, but in terms of exchange of students, I exchange see. of researchers. And that's very good for a global community because PJ. I agree with you. Only I, with openness we can win the, the next challenges. I, I totally agree. Uh, we have. Uh, students from 30 different countries on our campus in, in Malaysia. And they come from Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, <coughs> Central Asia. And, and it's amazing that this is happening in the way, in the fashion that it is. And English is the language on campus, so to speak, because it is a matter of preparing uh, the next generation for a global civilization, for the global village, as it were. Now, I'm, I'm very clear that a lot of the changes in the uh, the, the current developments, the fear that is out there, it's, it's something that it's very much a political situation as opposed to an economic one. Right. We've got 10 minutes to run, and I'm conscious there are three over, uh, certainly three outstanding questions, quite apart from the Brexit question, which I think hopefully was uh, answered over lunch today uh, with, a, with a British minister. But um, there was one particular one from the lady at the back there about uh, national debt and the central banks as well. Uh, a sense, and she was expressing without much detail, of course, um, anxiety, frustration, but real fear that there was a serious problem here on the issue of debt. John. Well, it is a, a big concern, and I, I think even in the United States, where uh, there's perhaps not the same level of social spending proportionately as there might be in some of the other OECD countries, we have this phenomenon where the issue, entitlements have grown as a proportion of our federal budget uh, dramatically over the past 50 years, and uh, discretionary spending, if you factor out defense, which is uh, at the moment <laughs> increasing substantially, it's something up to a $700 billion budget for the Defense Department uh, next year, uh, there's not much left for anything else. So. It is an issue. It's an issue of uh, priorities in a society. What, uh, what uh, spent expenditures do you value over others? And I, I like to say that there's one thing that Republicans and Democrats can agree upon in Washington, and that is to spend more money. Uh, and, and usually that's the way they end up resolving these issues. But so, does this, is this kind of concern as expressed by the, the, the lady up there, do you think that's really understood, particularly for the next generation, understood in the political class? Well, I don't think it's adequately understood or appreciated by our members of Congress, or they don't have sufficient courage to step up to it. You, you can't <laughs> want to spend at the level we spent and cut taxes uh, at the same time, which is what we've done. And uh, Pete Peterson, who just died, the late Pete Peterson, who was uh, the head of uh, Blackstone Company and had been a Secretary of Commerce. He devoted much of the latter part of his life uh, to writing about uh, this issue of how we're 
we're leaving a legacy to our children and grandchildren of this emo enormous debt overhang, and it is truly a serious problem. And I don't think our, our Congress people yet have sufficient courage to act upon it. Jose Manuel, do you think that this is a terrible legacy which has still not been resolved? I agree. In fact, but uh, I agree that also, but that's an ideological position. I know there are people who oppose that. People believe that, in fact, there is no problem with public debt. In fact, we should invest more. So, first of all, debt, in principle, is bad. Of course, there are some exceptions if it's debt for financing investment. The problem is that we have today debt that is for financing permanent uh, expenditure. And of course, someone has to pay one day or another. We saw here in Europe, and not only in Europe, during the last financial and sovereign debt crisis, that the most affected countries were, in fact, those who had higher levels of debt, uh, public debt to the GDP ratio. So this is a problem. Uh, so that's why I'm in favor of prudent fiscal spending and of targeted investment. And I think it's important that our countries, including the richer ones, do not become complacent with the high levels of debt. We do, are leaders, do leaders get this? Do the uh, political class I get mean, it? some yes, some no. There is an ideological difference. In Europe, for instance, there is an ideological difference. There are countries who are extremely tough on that, those issues. The others say, no, in fact, we should not put that as a priority. The more important thing is growth, so we can live with the more, more debt. In fact, we, there is not a problem in creating more debt. So I think. As a matter of prudence, and I know the word prudence today is not very fashionable, but I think it's a great legacy from classic Greece, prudence. I think in terms of prudence, we should avoid what for me appears at uh, unsustainable levels of debt. And also from an ethical perspective, it means that our generation is overspending and that we are pushing that debt for new generations. I don't think it's fair in terms of intergenerational justice. Vijay, that word ethical just came into Jose Manuel's yes. language there. The ethical issue of debt. Agreed. Well, let's take a look at what this debt has been financing for the last five decades or so. The biggest <coughs> spending of the US government happens to be in defense. And that's a whole lot of money that's going out there, in, in, a, in a sense. But let's take a look at Germany and Japan, and how they are many, able to manage their, their uh, debt, as it were and how they've done it so effectively. Is it uh, a matter of prudent spending, or is it about spending it in the right place where the generation leads to further development of the economy? They have been very economy-driven. So has South Korea, so has Japan, Taiwan, and so on. And it's, it is essentially about changing the direction in which the money is being spent. Infrastructure, clearly, I mean, the US has to develop its infrastructure you know, tremendously, and also, to spend it on developing the economy. Instead and of central building, banks, that question about central banks. And instead of building a new wall down south, <laughs> you should be spending the money elsewhere. But I just, I, I've got to jump in. I mean, really, it's the entitlements and the health care spending and Social Security that uh, add to our debt inexorably. And it's just going to keep going on until somebody comes to grips with a better way to fund it. And aging, John? Yeah, well, so what's wrong with aging? It's <laughs> better. <laughs> I wasn't looking at anybody. Right. There was, a, there was a really important question at the, right at the beginning about waging peace effectively, which is a very loaded question five minutes before the end. But um, what's your view? It's a, it's a fascinating uh, way it's been expressed. Of course, in many ways, there are fewer wars than ever. Fewer people are dying from in war, but the wars are vicious, nasty, Syria, Yemen, and everywhere else you know about. What about this, this principle, John, with your intelligence hat on here? Okay, well, I mean, I think from a point of view of the United States and from the point of view of a grand strategy, it seems to me uh, our approach is to have a strong economy and a strong defense and have a network of alliances around the world. That is sort of our core strategy. Then the question is, how do you deal with uh, partners around the world, and how do you deal with some of the terrible issues that we've been talking about, whether it's uh, state failure or conflicts in, in Africa, for example, where the, which is where the United Nations has most of its peacekeeping missions. And I would say perhaps one of the most effective things that could be done, I'm not saying it's easy, 
but to promote uh, peace in various parts of the world is for the pe permanent five, especially the United States, Russia, and China, to work together on these issues. I think at the minute amongst the great powers you see ser serious differences, like between the United States and China, it's going to be harder to accomplish. So I would argue for, to use a you know, shorthand uh, from the UN, I would say P P permanent five, P5 unity is extremely important. Waging peace effectively, Jose Manuel. Well, uh, from a European Given where wars have started, including recently in Yemen, yeah. and uh, with worse still threatening. As you said, Nick, uh, if you look uh, statistically, in fact, we are now having much less conflicts or at least much less casualties. All the, the casualties we had in the 20, 21st century are a small part of some of the big battles we had in the Second uh, uh, or sometimes First World War. Having said that, of course, that is, we should not be complacent. We had a terrible situation from Syria to Yemen to many other parts. I'm very pessimistic about the Middle East. I think the situation is going to get worse. Uh, that, by the way, I've been always very pessimistic about And to about be clear, do you think that can be mediated? There can be reconciliation? I mean, I think one condition I've learned during my experience, including mediating peace, con mediating peace conflicts like Angola or also in other cases, we cannot impose peace from outside. Uh, uh, we require, uh, of course, uh, the, we, from outside, from the international community, from the United Nations, we can create better external conditions for peace. And it's very important. Having said that, nothing replaces the internal conditions locally, the causes. And what I see sometimes, I don't see enough political will on the warring parties in the Middle East, for instance. I, I really believe some of them prefer, prefer, not, not the people, but the leaders, they prefer to keep war going on. They have some advantages also from uh, many points of view and strategic points of view. So it's extremely uh, difficult and we have to be realistic about that. Uh, I, I agree that now we have, for the Middle East, we have to do, ask the people in the, con in the region to do more themselves. Because if we, we have learned the highway that it's not the West, the Americans and the Europeans, they cannot solve the Middle East problems, and, for, and sometimes, in fact, we can, uh, not with that intention, but you can even get them become worse. So the political we, will is sending conflict in a different direction. But, but, but one, one thing I think it is important, maybe now it's a little bit uh, idealism or dreaming too much, but won't it be possible in the age of social media today that we launch some movements for peace, trying to unite the societies so, uh, above or against sometimes our leaders. One thing it's quite clear, as Ambassador Negropont said, today the United Nations are very often paralyzed by the difficulties among the P5 members. I mean, it's critical to today. I mean, my, my compatriot now, Antonio Guterres, is the Secretary General of the United Nations. I visited him recently in, a, in his office in New York in the United States, and of course, I, and he told me how difficult it is today. I mean, he's trying to do his best, of course, but when the, the P5, they use their veto, some of them. Of course, uh, there is no decision. So we have to think. The United Nations, we have to continue to invest in the institutions because they are there for some purpose. But for, let's be frank. The United Nations alone, they will not solve those problems. So maybe we could think about ways of engaging directly this intermediated <coughs> context between the societies, Thank you, yes, between yes. the yep. people that are, in fact, suffering the most from conflicts. All right. Uh, I'd like you to wind up the whole session, if you could, VJ, particularly with <coughs> you, as a, you as a business person, a successful business person, the role now of geopolitics in the kind of commercial calculations you are having to make. Well, let me just answer briefly this, this thing about waging pre peace. Actually, uh, going back to the 1960s, I think one of the amazing things that the United States was able to do in terms of waging peace was simply John F. Kennedy's Peace Corps. The Peace Corps did so much out there. Its, its power, the soft power of the United States actually went out there in ways that it created generations of people who didn't grow, grow up to understand the US as, i.e., you know, the ugly American, so to speak. They grew up with the understanding of the U.S. Of, that was totally different, a softer, better understanding. And the Peace Corps was a fabulous project. The money that was poured into the Vietnam War, the Korean War, etc., and so on, a lot of which was simply you know, political decisions, I would say. 
ones that were doomed to failure from the very beginning. Nevertheless, that money, had that gone into building the Peace Corps, that would have been amazing. China has taken a leaf out of the US, taken a leaf out of the US strategy, and what they're doing right now with this Belt and Silk Road project is amazing. And their influence in these countries that they are going in to build is also interesting. Because they're coming in, as you say, they're coming in from the inside. They're building roads, they're building ports, they're building airports. Now the governments want to listen to them. So this is an amazing thing to do. And quickly, the role of geopolitics in everything you calculate as a corporate leader. It is, it is something that we take into account every single day. We have to deal with the fact that you know, governments don't really represent the legacy of the people. They are there to govern, but it is the governed that are more relevant. So when we make decisions, we always look towards the longer term, the legacy, towards the governed as opposed to governments. Thank you. Um, I hate to end this. We've had a very rich hour. I've counted the number of questions. There were 13 questions. We've answered 12 of them. So that's pretty good in a one-hour session. <laughs> Can I just give you one uh, uh, personal reflection? We heard from Jose Manuel Barroso about Guterres, who's the UN Secretary General. I was in uh, the United Nations last week, and we're trying to end this on an upbeat. But I heard him say twice in public, things are going backwards more than I can ever remember in my career and my life. And secondly, the president of the General Assembly, Miroslav Lajcak from Slovakia, saying very publicly, the problem now is that all the institutions are now under threat. And much of what we've created and created with stability in the last 70 years is now being unpicked. I leave that thought with you because that comes from the United Nations. So can I thank the three panelists and all of you for your interventions right at the beginning. Thanks.